So, sociologist, yesterday I turned off my sound when I was recording something from the computer to the computer on a different format, and I didn't realise I'd done it, which meant that I recorded the entirety of today's lesson yesterday without sound. Um, several people spotted this. Thank you very much for pointing it out, because I didn't notice. Um, it looked like it had sound when I uploaded it, because, of course, it was playing it back through OBS where I turned the sound off. So OBS just played it back to me with sound, so I thought it was fine. Anyway, today's lesson, we're moving on, and I'll do it properly this time. We're looking at observations. And you know what? Maybe it's best that I'm doing it again, and maybe it's best that I'm a little bit brighter and more awake than I was yesterday when I was recording the lesson. So my apologies for this going up late. Um, do not worry if you have to take extra time to do this. I fully appreciate and understand. And of course, when you come back on the Tuesday, uh, you will be doing uh, more of these style of lessons, so there'll be plenty of time to catch up. It's not a major issue. Um, so, without further ado, let us talk about observations as a method of research. And before I go any further, consider the sorts of things you might want to research as a sociologist. And one of those things, I think, would be criminality. That is, um, well, essentially, I guess, um, people what break the law. And you might say, so your background image usually matches what you're talking about, but this one has no match. It's a bunch of students in a library doing things on laptops. How's that criminality? Or are you going to throw us a curveball about piracy online or something? Um, and I'm going to say, well, no, no, it's a bunch of sociologists carrying out research and it has nothing to do with criminality. It's just the background image I found and I liked it and it will make more sense later. I shall refer to it again. Um, but in the main, um, criminality is... Uh, one of the main problems when you have with between saying and doing. You may recall that when we did um, our work on interviews and questionnaires, one of the key things, the dark figure of validity, was having people respond to these things and not necessarily knowing whether or not their responses were actually what they did. They said they did it, but were they actually doing it? And you may recall we talked about wanting to repress, impress, sorry, not repress, impress the researcher or to fit societal norms or to give a good account of oneself or to say things that they thought people wanted or to say things that put the respondent in a positive light rather than a negative one. All of these things will affect whether or not what they say is valid. That doesn't mean they're lying necessarily, but lies are lies. Lies are any untruth. And as House MD um, said, it was played by Hugh Laurie in an American TV show based on Sherlock Holmes, hence the name House. Um, his friend was called Wilson, um, like Watson. And um, he used to say, everybody lies. And, and I would have found a video clip, but frankly, I, I don't know whether I'm talking with the right zeitgeist. Um, the point is, everybody does lie. They just do. It's what we do. And it depends on who we're talking to as to what we lie about, how much we lie about it, and whether or not we can take anything at face value. Understanding the difference between saying and doing is therefore incredibly important for a sociologist in trying to understand how society works and why people behave the way they do, which is what sociology is all about. So how do you fix that problem? What do you do about the issue of not knowing what the lies are and therefore basing your uh, facts and uh, studies on the wrong thing? How, how do you account for that dark figure? Well, one way around it is simply just observe people in everyday life. You go and look at what they do day in, day out, and you make observations and you say, well, all right, they're doing this. They say they're doing something different. Therefore, we know the validity now. We know what people are prepared to lie about and for. Um, because oftentimes people will lie about the most ridiculous things. I've mentioned before about my own lies at school and some of the lies that I told were utterly ridiculous. Um, and, and understanding where they're coming from because they're so weird and personal is important to a sociologist. So how do we do it? We do it through observation. There are two types of observation we're going to concern ourselves with here. Uh, Non-participant and participant. Non-participant is standing aside from a vantage point, maybe in a white coat, separate from the behaviour you are observing and in no way, shape or form involved in it. Uh, taking notes from the sidelines. Um, you might do this watching football crowds or watching people on the street or, or just, you know, people watching at an uh, uh, airport taking notes. Th these, these are non-participant. You're not part of the group. You're not part of the situation. You're observing dispassionately. Participant observation is taking part, so maybe 
watching a football crowd whilst also at a football match, um, going to the pub afterwards with people, dressing up in the right clothes and colours so that people will talk to you from that team supporters. Or in terms of um, an airport people watching session, you might also be yourself an airline traveller and as a consequence you are a participant in events. Maybe you're observing people you personally know. Maybe you're not and you've sort of pushed yourself into a group like, I don't know, people working on the reception desk of an airline and you might be dressed like one of them and carrying out the job or just involved in the back room issue so you can get a better view of what people do when they don't think they're being watched. That would be participant observation. There are two types of observations in those things as well, so you can break it down further. Break down, sorry. Um, there's overt and covert. Overt is where you tell people your real identification, you tell people your purpose, and you tell people what you're doing. Uh, and this is ethically sound. It's good for ethics, and it means that people can give permission and give that whole idea of informed consent to be observed. Covert, and I like this because it's only an extra letter, means undercover. Covert. Sounds fun, doesn't it? It's a lovely sound word. Um, whereas, I don't know, wench or bench or clench. Ugh, horrid word. Um, though I have no view either way on the word moist. Most people apparently hate it. Um, obviously, uh, covert is not telling people what you're about. Now you might say, sir, that's obvious. There's, there's two extremes here. And I say, well, yeah, but sometimes you end up with things in between. Um, so, for example, a lot of studies are in between. White study of street corner society, in which he looked at gangs in um, inner cities and how they operated. Street corner gangs, they were called. Um, he told one person his purpose and identity, and that one person got him in touch with all the other people who did not know his research purpose and did not know his real identity. So, was it covert or was it overt? Well, it was both and also neither. It was a point between those two extremes because he told one person who then accepted what he was doing and was able to give his permission, but then introduce him to other people who apparently, well, weren't. And as far as they knew, he was just a friend of this person who introduced them. So their permissions were slightly different. Do you see what I mean? Uh, you can understand why it was necessary. If you're under trying to get into street gangs, you can't really say, I'm studying street gangs. They'll behave very differently if there's a semi-official um, person coming to observe them than they will if it's just a friend of a friend. The next way you can differentiate is between unstructured and structured. And obviously you'll say, well, sir, aren't most observations unstructured? You can't have a recipe, you can't have a set path uh, in an observation. People will behave in ways you cannot predict. Therefore, most of them are going to be unstructured, right? And, and duh. Well, yeah, obviously, you're right. Absolutely. Most are like that. Um, that said, though, or most interesting ones, there are a lot of structured versions. Now, in a structured observation, there'll be a schedule. That schedule, not schedule, school, but not not schedule. Schedule is an Americanism. Um, I suppose it doesn't really matter. Uh, but schedule. A schedule is a set of how you're going to observe. So let's take, for example, the non-participant observation of children in a nursery. And you're looking at gender stereotypes. So you're looking through a two-way mirror. The parents have given permission. You're in a white coat or whatever. And your researchers are behind that mirror watching the boys and girls in the nursery and just noting down various things. And you tell them that you want them to note down uh, at what time certain toys are picked up, how long they're played with for, and that's it. That is a schedule, and it's a structured observation. And that allows you to get raw data that you can then turn into bar charts and things. And maybe you assign masculine or feminine tendencies to different toys, and therefore you can track how masculine or feminine students, I say students, uh, these children are in nursery, and whether or not they're affected by stereotypes in wider society at that early age. You can see how this will be useful, helpful, and also why it would be pretty boring to talk about any more than that. And we will come back to it for obvious reasons. Um, many researchers cannot be a participant observer in school situations. So when we talk about methods in context, you'll find we talk more about structured versions and um, overt observations. But it's fun to talk about the other type too, and that's probably where we're going to start. Uh, you can combine these, by the way, with other methods to check the validity of those methods, and also to use those methods to check the validity of what you're observing. So questionnaires are a really good way of tripping people up who have been acting 
um, especially if you've got double blind questions and questions that ask the same thing like in that 16 personalities quiz uh, designed to make sure you're not trying to game the system or you do it through an interview just to double check it on their own and see if people have the same reasons for their motivations that you observed earlier if that makes sense so uh, interviewing the nursery children talked about earlier you might find that they believe they were playing with what they termed a girl's toy when you designed it a masculine uh, stereotype for example and this brings me to a task and uh, it's the first thing I'm going to ask you to do it's in the show my homework section and I'm sorry that you're having to do this later in the day than had originally been broadcast and I apologize that it took me so long to work out there was no sound um, thank you to those of you that pointed it out to me so you're going to be a sociologist because you are and you're going to study the subculture of the alt-right because it's you know current and you're going to look at trump supporting population of the usa and you've decided that the trump supporting population you're going to look at is the proud boys don't worry you don't have to research them um, based on the photograph i've included below i would like you to have a go at these first two tasks what characteristics might you need to join in and how are you going to observe them? What are you going to observe them doing? And when do you think you're going to get the data you need to understand why they behave the way they do? What sorts of things would you like to watch them doing? So have a go at writing down, just jot down some characteristics and have a go at designing your study. If the pregnant pause wasn't enough, by the way, I'm intending for you to pause the video and do that now. Good, I'm going to assume you've done that. Now, it doesn't really matter what your answers are, provided you've had a go. So let's look at the characteristics. They're dressed in military uniforms, or rather, surplus military. They're dressed with those orange hats. They're generally male. They're generally bearded. They're generally tattooed. They're wearing sunglasses. They've got trappings of masculinity. The female versions of uh, these proud boys, and they exist, if you look carefully at the crowd there in the background, tend to, well, they be in the background. They, they, they take this the apparently subservient female role, though oftentimes they're actually quite strong-willed and will not do as they're told. They will accept certain sexist behaviours from the men whilst also decrying it in others. It's a really interesting dynamic. But you can see how physically there's a lot of characteristics you've got to, to fit in. Some of you will be unable to fit in. Um, you can get away with not being white, but again, you look at them, most of them are white. Designing your study? Well, it's probably not going to work if you go to their homes, for example, and it's probably not going to work if you go to, I don't know, a street protest, that, that they're behaving in a very particular way. Though, that said, you might join their planning uh, time beforehand and then go and join them in that protest. You're a participant observer. That's the idea. Um, so you watch them when they, well, do you tell them that you're there? Will that affect how they behave around you? How will that affect how they behave? Consider that for a moment. The third task is to come up with obstacles that might get in your way of finding out why they do what they do and you using them as a study. And we're going to use the 6th of January 2021 because it turns out you're going to be there in this thought experiment. Now, I should point out the link there and the link in the show my homework comes with a health warning. If you click it, it'll say that it's got violent scenes uh, that some may find distressing. There's no blood, there's no assault, um, but by the same token, I fully appreciate why that's there. If you don't want to watch it you don't have to if you're going to watch it go and watch it now and then pause the video and i'll explain afterwards okay if you watched it you know what happened if you didn't and chose not to go through and that's fine what you've seen there is uh, what you would have seen was some chaotic scenes where the proud boys attacked police where they took control of the floor of the senate and where some of them actively went out to kidnap and murder various members of an elected government if you were trying to observe them doing that, what problems might you fi find? If you had uh, been overt in your observation, would they have let you see what they're about? Would they have lied to you? How would they have lied? If you were covert, would that mean you had to take part to show your loyalty? What about the moral implications? And would you have been able to carry out all the observation? Furthermore, if you got to know the group and got familiar with them, how might that have formed an obstacle in reporting on what they did when they broke the law? How might being part of the group bias your findings or make it really difficult to do your research? How would you communicate your purpose to them? Would you communicate your purpose to them? Would that be a safe thing to do with a group like the Proud Boys who are clearly armed? And how would you record your findings? Uh, in the video clip, 
it was a journalist from ITV recording his findings. He had a camera crew. How would you do yours? Would you film it on your phone? Would that be safe? Would that be wise? Would you have to write it down later, therefore relying on your memory? In an event like that, I imagine memories will be very, very different. And that problem of getting too involved in events and being sucked into things you don't want to is the subject of this second video clip from Louis Theroux, who you may remember when we talked about interviews, and he was interviewing the most hated family in Britain. Now, this link carries another warning. One of the episodes on Louis Theroux's weird weekends was joining the pornography industry uh, in filming a, pornog a po pornographic title. And one of the clips, it's very cringe, it's not pornographic, uh, shows him getting a little bit too into the role and enjoying himself. In fact, most of these are where Louis Theroux kind of forgets that he's a researcher and an outsider and starts joining in with the group. The very first one is with Born Again Christians, and Louis Theroux was painfully aware of what he was doing and voices over to explain what's going on, uh, because it is really quite cringy. It's worth a watch. You don't have to watch the whole thing. It's about 14 minutes long. You only have to watch the first seven minutes or so to get the idea. You don't even have to watch the bit in the pornography industry. I'm merely mentioning it just in case your parents walk in mid-clip and you have to explain what's going on. Um, so, do watch the first, I don't know, six minutes, I think, is perfectly safe um, before you get to the pornography industry one. And um, if you want to watch all of it, you can. Uh, but pause the video now to go and watch the potential issues with getting too involved and too familiar with the groups you're with. OK, I'm assuming you've watched it and you've seen how Louis Theroux, bless him, gets a little bit too enthusiastic sometimes and joins in a little bit too much. And that's the problem of a participant observer. Which brings me on to, let's talk about participant observations. Um, basically, why are we focusing on these? It's more interesting. Even the textbook says so. Even the exam boards say so. This is more interesting than other types. So we'll focus on it a bit because it's fun. And why not, eh? Why not? So um, the focus is here because it's more interesting and it's really good to talk about. It leads to a meaty discussion. So why not? There are two major issues we need to know about participant observation. The first is, uh, I guess, split into three. Uh, getting into the group staying in the group, and then getting out after your study is complete. The second major issue is using covert or overt observation. And my intent, my intent here is to go through each of them in turn. Now, we're 17 minutes into this video, and it's the second time of recording, and it's going to go up late um, for the lesson. So I don't intend to tarry. I won't get through everything. I'll try and get to the same point that I was aiming for in the first time I recorded this. Um, we'll see how we go. So the first thing I want to talk about is getting in to the group. And that depends very much on the type of group you're trying to study. Uh, getting into a football crowd is easy. You can turn up. You buy a ticket to the football game. You're in the crowd. I did this a lot as a child. I didn't really enjoy football. I don't mind watching. I understand the sport. Uh, but I've never really been a football fan. I used to go and watch Carlisle United. And if you've even heard of that team, you're better than I. Um, I went to watch Manchester United with my father, but mainly that was to go with my dad. And I enjoyed watching the game. I could tell you all about Ince's goal, which dates it, I think. Uh, for those of you that are actually fans of football, you might remember Paul Ince or know of Paul Ince. Um, but frankly, I didn't really go and get the same out of it that my dad did. I went because he was going. I went to share the experience. I was briefly obsessed with Jurgen Klinsmann uh, in the late 1990s and ended up watching Sunderland when he played for Sunderland and really enjoyed myself. But most of the time, and the reason I raised this, I was actually watching the football crowd. I was watching how people responded to it. I was watching the songs, um, or rather listening to the songs, and the chants, and how people responded, and how the crowd responded to what was happening on the field, because that was way more interesting. Were I doing a sociological study, I'd have written that down, and I'd been able to do so. No one would have quibbled me sitting there writing things down as they occurred overtly. Um, joining that group would have been easy, even though I didn't really get football. However, if I wanted to study criminal gangs and how they behaved, well, that would be more difficult. I probably wouldn't be able to just randomly take notes. They'd legitimately ask me why I was doing that. I wouldn't be able to sort of just hang around as an interested observer. Just, you carry on, you, you carry on with that axe, I'll just watch what you're doing. It's not really going to work terribly well. It's dangerous as much as anything else. So you can see how there are potential problems depending on the group you're getting into. So how do you get in? The first way, um, the first thing you need to do is make contact with that group. And it depends on what the group is as to how you make contact. 
there are three main ways. There's using your own personal skill, there's using connections that you may have, and there's using plain dumb luck, chance. And I've got an example for each. The first example is Ned Polsky, who was a good pool player, and therefore, in 1971, he was able to get involved in a pool hustling group. What's a pool hustler? It's someone who essentially skirts the edge of the law, engaging in borderline illegal activity to defraud people out of money through bets. This often transfers into actual illegal activity. Uh, so basically you lose a couple of games and then convince your mark uh, to go double or nothing or something like that. And then of course win, because you're actually got quite good at pool. Polsky was good enough at pool to basically play the hustlers and therefore behave as one. He was able to join them that way. His skills made it acceptable for him to join. I wouldn't be able to join such a group. I lack the skill at pool. Equally, skills could be in other things, but there's your example. The next one is connections. Knowing the right people. With me, with football crowds, it would be my dad. He knows people who go to watch football quite regularly, going to watch football quite regularly himself. So he would be my connection. But of course, you don't have to have a dad in it. Um, Patrick, in 1973 in Glasgow, um, had an ex-student. He taught in what we'd now call a reform school, uh, basically Borstal or Child Jail. Um, one of his students turned out to be involved in a gang and he was no longer a teacher and he was able to ask that student to introduce him to the Glaswegian gang. So he did. And because Patrick himself had a youthful appearance, he was able to pass himself off as a friend of the ex-student, the ex-pupil, and essentially join the gang and be accepted as part of that gang because his ex-student knew him and therefore he was vouched for. Does that make sense? So connections, knowing the right people. And thirdly, there's dumb luck. Uh, Fairhurst uh, had to carry out a sociological study for a university course and had back trouble and was hospitalised. So she decided to carry out an observation study of how hospitals worked. She was in hospital, therefore she got to talk to nurses, doctors, other patients in the unit because she herself was a patient and therefore people would talk to her and share ideas and she could write up the notes later. Dumb luck. And it was really good. One of the most groundbreaking studies on how hospitals worked. No one else had done it. So, yeah, huge stuff. Next, after you've made contact, would be acceptance. That is, getting into the group and having the group accept you and behave normally around you. A good example of this is Thornton in 1995. She had a friend called Kate, I've put her in inverted commas, that's her actual name, um, and she was looking at the clubbing and rave scene. And she said that, yeah, it was really interesting, and because she had a friend, she was introduced to the group. She was Canadian, was Thornton, Kate was British, and it was the clubbing and rave scene in the UK in the 1990s, which was a big deal. Um, as the boyfriend of Kate pointed out, how do we know she's not going to sell her notes to the Daily Mail? Which would be a problem. But she got round that by being friends with people. The issue she found with trust and acceptance here was that slowly but surely she was ageing out of the uh, age group that she wanted to study and out of the scene itself. She wouldn't be accepted the same way. What up, my dudes? It would be a bit like me doing that and trying to get involved in youth culture. There are certain problems here. So there are issues even if you can gain the trust and acceptance. And of course people are going to view you with suspicion. Um, I'm sure Kate's boyfriend probably didn't behave entirely naturally around Thornton because, yeah, there's always that worry that she could sell them out to the newspapers for a profit and uh, you end up demonised for what you're doing. Uh, Leibau in 1967 um, was a white man who got really into the black street corner gangs that he was studying um, because he got on well with them and that they introduced him to their culture. Um, he was accepted as part of the group despite being white with black street gangs. Basically, his skills and his personality and character meant that they accepted him in a big, big way, which is a powerful, powerful tool. Um, so you can get into places that you might not be able to. And the apogee of this, and the last thing I'll talk about today, is Griffin in 1962. You may remember when we were talking about interviews where he essentially changed his skin tone and dressed differently and was able to gain access and interview people in his seminal study, Black Like Me. But part of that study, the show itself, Black Like Me, not the interviews that formed its part, was actually a participant study. He himself was able to experience life in the deep south of the USA, in segregated USA, as a black man. And as a consequence, was able to observe groups of people without them knowing that they were being observed, and thus 
you could argue, more naturally. Um, but managed to get himself accepted by the groups he was talking to as a black man, and they didn't question it, which you can see the potential advantages of. Now, I've actually made this video a bit shorter than the original, and um, I've covered slightly more ground, mainly because of panic, I think, and the fact that I'm gabbling my words. And that means you'll probably need to watch parts of this video again, slow them down. There are those three tasks. The first two, where you're saying what the characteristics are of the Proud Boys and what you'd need to gain access and trust of that group. You might want to go back and double check the, your answers to that. There's no right answer, it's just a way of exemplifying what I'm talking about. And you might want to look again at the design of the study about what you're trying to find out and where you'd best find out what they're doing. There's also that third task, which again, I've hinted at strongly already, but you'll be able to go back to that now and say, okay, well, what are the potential obstacles there and why are they obstacles? And again, it will be a for instance rather than a specific example to help you explain what the potential issues are. And I'm hoping that you found why it is the exam board uh, have tackled this and called it an interesting study and an interesting thing to look at. And I'm hoping that I've managed to communicate that effectively, even if my video is slightly rushed and I've been gabbling at speed um, because I've had tea with sugar in it, um, teacups over there. Um, thank you very much if you have been for watching. My apologies for the confusion. Um, just goes to show, even after all this time, I'm still making basic noob errors. Uh, there are links to all the video clips in the description below. Do make sure you use them if you wish, with the caveats that I hinted at earlier. There's no compunction that you have to watch them. I'd share them in the classroom, but that would be different because uh, there's a different situation there and I'd be able to explain fully and people would be able to talk back to me. If you've chosen not to watch those, that is perfectly fine. I hope you're having a good day. Have a lovely weekend. And I'll see you in the next video when hopefully it will be recorded first time with actual sound. Thank you very much. Bye now.